Hello and welcome to 3ABN Worship Hour. We thank you for taking the time to tune in to a program that we believe will encourage you, will awaken you, will calibrate your thoughts in this new environment that we are all finding ourselves having to exist, as some call it, the new normal. And we're praying that this is not the way it's always going to be. But until that time changes, 3ABN has taken the time to produce programming, particularly Sabbath morning programming, to encourage your heart and keep you focused in these dizzying and troublesome times. Today's message is entitled Coronavirus Aftermath. What's going to happen after? What is the coronavirus environment laying the groundwork for? Well, that I'll address today in God's word. But before we go any further, uh, Tim Parton is here to lead us in prayer and meditative thoughts, preparing our minds for what God has in store for us. Let's turn the time over to Tim. I want to encourage you today that God is still on the throne and he always will be. And we should sing our praises to him. Sing to the king who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation His empire shall bring. Joy to the nations when Jesus is King. So come let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Zephaniah 317 says, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. And he will rejoice over you with singing. Dear Lord, I am so grateful that you are my Lord God. You are the powerful, powerful one who wins my battles. You are happy to be with me. You pour your love into me and you give me new life. You sing with joy over me because I am yours. Father, for those who are watching, Lord, you know the needs that are represented around this world. They're not just virus related. They're physical, mental, emotional, financial, spiritual. Lord, as long as we live on this earth, we will have needs. We will be in need of you. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name, as we cry out to you, that you will hear our hearts and hear our prayers, hear our cries. Lord, heal our land. Do what only you can do. And we anticipate your return, Lord. We long for the day. For his returning, we watch and we pray. We will be ready the dawn of that day. We'll join in singing with all the redeemed. For Satan is vanquished and Jesus is King. So come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Sing to your King. Sing to 
the King. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much for that. Let us bow our heads as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, as we now open the message, Coronavirus Aftermath, Lord, continue to send your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Those watching, thank you for the words of encouragement through song to soften the human heart. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit will do the work that will open the minds of your people. And for those that don't know you, that they will hear the invitation extended to them in this crisis hour to come into the place of peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Coronavirus aftermath. You know, friends, we live in an environment now where two components exist side by side. On one side, you have the component of fear. Let me give you an example. If you ask the politician today how he feels, he would say, I feel helpless. I don't know what to do for my constituents. I'm looking for answers to calm their fears, but I feel helpless. If you ask the medical professional how they feel, they would say they feel terrified. They feel uh, at the point where their lives are on the line. They don't know what to do, and they go to work with this fear and this terror in their hearts as they, too, try to find answers to this devastating invasion called the coronavirus. If you ask the business owners how they feel, they would say, I feel like my business is going to crumble. My future is going to crumble. I have no answer for the dilemma of my employees, for the information that I can give to the community, for the services I provided. They feel very unstable. Fear is the environment that the world finds itself in. But the danger is to make decisions based on fear rather than on the second component. You see, in every crisis, there's fear, but there is truth. Fear is a variable. Truth is a constant. And when you study God's word, you find that the Lord never wanted his people to make a decision based on fear, but always on truth. That's why you find in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 15, I lay the foundation with this scripture. Listen to what God's word says to us. The Bible says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Notice, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But notice what he goes on to say. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Notice the decision. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is saying to his people, we are on the other side of the river now. And friends, I can say to you, we are on the other side of the river. On one side was peace and financial security. On one side was a predictable future, pleasure, comfort, all of the accoutrements of life, all of the things that we love to indulge in. But now we're on the other side of the river. And on this side is fear and uncertainty. People are not sure. We are in a new set of circumstances, and, and Joshua refers to it here as the gods in whose land you now dwell. What are the gods? Fear, financial insecurity, uncertainty, an unstable future, politicians, business owners, and medical professionals. But then he says this, regardless of the environment that we're in, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let me make it very clear, friends. We have collectively arrived at the most intense season in modern history. We are facing a non-dimensional monolith of unpredictable proportions. We don't really know what to do next. But God is not asking us to make decisions based on fear. God is asking us to consult his word. In this environment, the greatest of the minds of the world are grappling with an elusive enemy, one that metamorphosizes, continue to change the way it attacks in Wuhan and Italy and Spain and America and various parts of the world. This virus is mutating and changing 
in the sense of the way that life is expected to be. People don't know what to do in this new environment, but today, allow me to summarize the intersection at which the world is assembled. Notice, non-essential stores and businesses are mandated close. Water and power is being shut off to businesses that disobey the compliance orders. Disneyland closed indefinitely. The entire Las Vegas Strip closed. Panic buying has set in bottle water, toilet supplies, disinfectant supplies, paper supplies, and hand sanitizer are now finally more desirable than gold. Shelves are bare. People are fighting and stealing others' supplies. Many schools, I would say most schools, are mandated to be closed for the rest of the school year. And friends, that's world over. Self-distancing measures are on the rise. On the rise, when you go to grocery stores, you find tape on the floor at the grocery stores, keeping people six feet apart. And the checkout counters, you find there they are sneeze bags, and some of the cashiers have on protective gear, gloves, and in some extreme cases, face masks. But is that really extreme considering the environment today? Store hours are now limited. From 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., our local Walmart that used to be 24 hours is simply now having to close to restock the shelves and prevent the indulge of the crowds when they come. You find when the stores open, even now a limited amount of people are allowed in the stores at one time. But let's expand the horizon. Parks, trails, beaches are closed. Entire cities are under lockdown. This is the new environment that's stimulating fear. All sporting events and seasons are canceled. All concerts, tours, festivals, entertainments canceled. All weddings, family celebrations, holiday gatherings, and sadly enough, in the atmosphere of all this death, even funerals are canceled. All dine-in only restaurants are closed indefinitely until further notice. And when you look at the highways like New York City and Los Angeles, major cities, not like our small town, but there is some impact there too, you'll find that the highways are bare, mostly trailer trucks, trying to keep the commerce and food getting to their desired destinations. Barely anyone on the roadways. I had a chance a few days ago to look at Times Square in New York City. A city that never sleeps is finally forced to sleep. And air travel is at an all-time minimum. Citizens are now being highly encouraged to self-quarantine, only leaving their homes for the essential supplies. And they're saying, wear the masks and the gloves when you're outside. Essential service workers are also terrified to go to work. Medical field workers are afraid to even go home to their families. And as of today, more than a million global cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed. But the question we must ask ourselves is why are the highest cases of COVID-19 showing up in certain major cities like Wuhan, China, and Italy, and Spain, and New York City? Well, I would suggest to you the groundwork is being laid for something that I call the aftermath. In the United States, there are more than 250,000 confirmed cases. And just think about it. Not too long ago, just March 11th, 2020, was when the World Health Organization officially declared the COVID virus to be a pandemic. But now, friends, instead of looking for the light at the end of the tunnel, people are now asking the question, how long are we going to be in this tunnel? The question is, how long? That repetitious reverberating question, how long? Consider, how long will it be before we get back to life as normal? How long will it be before we can go back to work? How long will it be before we can touch again? How long will it be before COVID-19 is finally gone? And I could say once again, we are living at a time with more questions than answers. More than ever before, the important questions are not when will the stock market level off, although many ask that question, or what team will win the next championship, or where can we go on the next cruise? I think right now a cruise is the last thing that will enter anyone's mind. And allow me to borrow a phrase from America's, one of most of the addictive magazines in America, The Inquirer. Inquiring minds want to know the answers. Well, friends, now let's look at the Bible to find the answers to these perplexing questions. Turn with me to one of the most relevant questions of the hour, 
that was asked by the disciples to Jesus after he finished outlining to the multitude the signs of the end, he took his disciples apart and began to reveal to them something even deeper than the multitude knew. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 24 and verse 3. It says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Tell us, when will these things be? We want to know, but I want to point something out. The Lord did not let the general majority know. He didn't reveal it to everyone, the politicians and the leaders and the teachers and the financial directors. He only told his disciples. The Bible says the secret things belong to us and to our children, but the things revealed, the secret things belong to God. And so he chooses to whom he revealed those secrets. David the psalmist says, the fear of the Lord and the secrets of God are with those who fear him. So the Lord, in this private environment, began to unfold to the disciples the atmosphere and all the signs leading to the coming of the Lord. Notice Matthew chapter 24. Let's go once again, verses 4 to verse 7. And Jesus answered and said to them, notice what he said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, he said. Why? For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And he continues. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. He said, when you look around, you're going to find famines, earthquakes, pestilences, COVID-19, pestilences, pandemic size diseases. You'll find it everywhere. Now we know this is not the first time a disease ever rose to the surface, but this is the first time the entire world has been put on pause by a disease. The entire world and some people might say, we've been preaching about wars and rumors of wars for, it seems like, maybe hundreds of years. But look at how Jesus described these things. Matthew 24 and verse 8, he says these words. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Notice, the beginning of sorrows, meaning Jesus said, this is how it's going to start. This is not how it's going to end. Notice, wars and rumors of wars, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. It goes from the end is not yet to the beginning of sorrows. And we are living in an environment where I can say unequivocally that the beginning of sorrows has begun. But I want you also to know that even though the world is suffering from sorrow that no bomb can heal right now, there's a purpose behind this. You see, it's in this environment that Jesus still wants to save his people. And you might think, well, why is he taking so long? Well, I'm, let me make it very clear. The repetition of our preaching about the signs are not irrelevant. But the reason why the Lord hasn't come yet is because he's showing us that he's patient. He is unwilling to turn his back on those that he died for. He wants to save humanity. So let me make an appeal before I read the next text. If you don't know the Lord, this is the time to get to know him. Because this is just a test of the emergency broadcast system. Or can I say, of the way the world responds in times of crisis. This is only a test. But how does the Apostle Peter describe the heart of God? Listen to his words. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, we read these words. He said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Notice he said, to repentance. Do we need to repent? Friends, if ever there was a time that we need to repent, it's now. Because no one has any guarantee have you seen the news? Have you seen all the refrigerator trucks in New York City? And now we know that this virus does not just inflict those who are a certain age and older, but even the young are now susceptible to it. That's why in many of the states, in the United States, they're shutting down the beaches. And in New York City, as my sister shared with me, 
Even the young people that want to go to the park and play basketball, they are so recalcitrant, so determined to follow their own way that the city has gone to extreme measures by taking down basketball rims. Why? To prevent even the young, because this disease is no respecter of person. But now when you begin to look at it, Jesus adds to it the intensity. The intensity is continuing. There's an atmosphere growing, and he says to us, while all these things are happening, learn the reason for them. Look at Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 to verses 34. The Lord says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, he said, know that it is near at the doors. And then he says in verse 34, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. This generation is not going anywhere. Wars, rumors of wars, nations rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, diseases, and earthquakes in various places, even in Idaho, even in places where earthquakes are not prevalent and not regular. They're happening everywhere. But he's saying these things must take place. And the generation that witnesses all of this collectively, just like the fig tree growing, showing us the summer is coming, all these collective signs indicate that the coming of the Lord is near. This is a wake-up time. But follow me carefully because I'm speaking about the aftermath today. Now notice in Matthew 24 and verse 9, when people ask, what's happening next? Well, we don't have to guess because the Bible makes it clear. And I believe you might be startled by the very next statement of Jesus. Matthew 24 and verse 9. And here are the words of Christ. He says, look at the next chapter. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. What? And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. All nations. For the first time in recorded history, not only just modern history, for the first time in recorded history, all nations are drinking from the same flask. All nations are standing on the same uncertain foundation. All nations, there is going to be an environmental shift. I like to call it a radical paradigm shift that will result in the followers of Christ being hated by all nations for the sake of Christ. But before the Bible identifies where the shift is going to occur, the Bible also identifies why the shift is going to occur. But let me describe what a paradigm shift is, because somebody might say, I never heard that phrase. A paradigm shift arises when the dominant model, when the dominant model under which normal functions operate is rendered incompatible. Let me explain before I finish the definition. You see, so many of us are, are used to getting up in the morning, going on the train, getting in our cars. So many people are used to buying a ticket, going to the airport and traveling. But when all of a sudden the dominant model, the regular rounds of life, is all of a, all of a sudden rendered incompatible with the present set of circumstances, a paradigm shift means they've got to look for a new model to operate in this new environment. Because you can't go to the airports. Nobody wants to fly. Nobody wants to be on the train. Nobody wants to stand shoulder to shoulder on any plane or any train with anybody in this new environment. So the paradigm shift says, new circumstances will facilitate the adoption of a new model or a paradigm. We can't live the way we did before. So we got to put a new model together to operate in this new environment. You've heard the idiom before, desperate times call for desperate measures. That means when we face extreme and undesirable situations, it is something necessary sometimes to take extreme actions. But there's a danger. There is a danger. Let me share the danger before I tell you the reason why this paradigm shift is taking place. There is a danger. Astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson said these following words. Listen carefully. He says, one of the dangers we face is to know enough about a subject to think that we're right, but not enough about that same subject to know that we are wrong. Let me repeat that one more time. One of the dangers we face as a people is to know enough 
about a subject to think that we are right, but not enough to know that we are wrong. And today, in this environment where new information is being sought, people are seeking information contemporarily, information politically, financially, socially, economically. But very few people are seeking information scripturally. You see, to find stability in this environment, we've got to find that the only place where stable information that can prevent fear from setting in, that can pre prevent us from making decisions based on fear, is in God's word, the only reliable information. And that's why Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Free from what? Free from fear and manipulation. Free from wanting to just give up life to merge with society's norms. Free from anything happening around you to challenge your commitment that is taking place within you. But when you look at the paradigm shift that's coming, the Lord is saying, this climate will be of such a, gratitude, such a gravity that people will think that they need to eliminate those that serve God. Now, before I talk about where it's going to happen, Jesus identifies why the environment is going to change where the people of God are going to be facing threat even of their lives. Look at John chapter 16, verses 1 to verses 3. Here's what the Bible says. We'll start with verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says, These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. Verse 1. Now verse 2. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. Now follow this for a moment. He'll think that he's offering God's service. Is there any example in the scripture of this happening? Yes, the three Hebrews in the courts of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar appeared to be the friends of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego until he decided that this is the way that we must worship from this point on. And then the lives of those three Hebrew worthies that seemed to have been in favor with Nebuchadnezzar prior to that moment when the paradigm shifted and a new political situation was arising. And worship was now being urged on the entire world. And these three Hebrews decided not to follow. Their lives were being put at threat of danger. You heard the story. The, the furnace was heated seven times hotter. So the scenario is not unusual. What about Daniel in the Medo-Persian Empire? When an edict was passed that no one should worship outside of the Medo-Persian regulations, Daniel ended up in the lion's den because his fear of God was greater than his fear of the political and religious environment. But God delivered him and God delivered the Hebrews. What about the apostles? When Paul and Barnabas were preaching and the apostles did not succumb to the pressure of the modern society, when the Jews and the Romans merged to control the growth of the New Testament church, the apostles ended up on numerous occasions in jail and Paul the apostle on several occasions and Peter the, and Peter the apostle for preaching the truth. But why did they end up in these situations? Here's the reason. Because they decided that serving God, even at a time of fear, was far more beneficial than serving God insisting that fear not be a part of the environment. In other words, saying that again, fear should never alter the way that we serve God. But the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. He said, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. Notice the word of God. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. How many friends? All. But they decided... It's better to serve God in an atmosphere of fear than allow an atmosphere of fear to take away my service to God. But if you decide to serve God, there will be fearful times. And the Bible says your dedication and commitment to Christ can put your life on the line. And when you look at the dark ages, millions of Christians lost their lives. But there's a resurrection day coming. There's a better resurrection coming. And that first resurrection will yield a harvest of those who will have eternal life. So don't allow the atmosphere of fear to rob your atmosphere of dedication to an unchanging God. That's why Jesus made it clear when he talked about those that are going to kill you, he also later unfolded the true nature behind those that threaten death 
to the true followers of God. And by the way, I read verse 3 and 4 of John chapter 16. Keep this in mind. As we end the first part of John chapter 16, it said that when they kill you, they would think that they're offering service to God, but notice the words of Christ. John 16, verse 3 and 4. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. In other words, when I was with you, I didn't have to warn you of this. But now that I'm leaving, I need to let you know. Those who desire to take your life and restrict your liberties, they don't know who I am. They have no connection to me, although they think they're offering God service. And so what he's saying is there's a pseudo-religious environment. There's a plastic religious environment. Religious-minded people, but not followers of Christ, will think that the best thing to do in a time of crisis and a time of paradigm shift is eliminate those whose allegiance to God is unshakable. And Jesus said they're going to do this because they have not known me and they have not known the Father. That's why it's critically important to understand that we are not Christians because of what we do, but because of what we are willing to do. That is, if we are willing to follow what God requires, our Christianity is defined on a higher level, not because we do Christian things, but because we're willing to follow what God requires. Notice Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Here's what Jesus said. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, and notice this, the pseudo-Christian environment, Many will say to me in that day, that's when the Lord comes, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and also cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Notice what Jesus pointed out. He said there is a lawless generation that's being developed and Isaiah chapter 24 talks about it. Psalms talks about it. The New Testament talks about it. The devil does not like the law of God. And he is saying in a lawless generation, in a generation that turns away from God, they will ignore the will of God. But those who refuse to ignore the will of God, there's a particular description the Bible gives about them in the book of Psalms chapter 40 and verse 8. Notice what David aligns with being allegiant to the will of God. Here's what he says in Psalm 40 and verse 8. He says, I delight to do your will, O my God. I delight to do your will, O my God. And your law is within my heart. Well, now get that. How can you do God's will and ignore God's law? Jesus is saying it. The psalmist David is saying it, and they are in harmony with each other. He is saying there is coming in the last days a generation that pushes out the law of God, and the Lord knew this would come. He predicted this, he predicted this in, in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Men will think to change times and laws. So we're living in this lawless environment, pushing out God's law, but feeling that their works of preaching and casting out demons and doing many wonderful things is a substitute. Friends, it's important to understand that those who claim to know God, Jesus, was, Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Now here's the question. How can we know whether or not we know Christ? Let's read 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. The Bible makes it very clear how we can know that we know Christ. And here's what the Bible says. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That's what the Bible says. Look at verse 4. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Let me make a statement. When it comes to being identified with Jesus, the one thing more important than saying I know him is Jesus saying I know you. You see, friends, that's why the Lord made it clear in John 14, 15, if you love me, notice what he says in his words, if you love me, do what, friends? Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Which brings me to a point I must ask or a statement I must make. If we don't love Jesus and his commandments more than we love the act of worship, 
we can easily fall into the category when the pressures of society and politics and the normal opinions begin to mold us in a different direction when the paradigm shift begins to be impacting our lives. We can easily fall into the category where we begin to persecute those who love Jesus and keep his commandments. And so, friends, the time is near. The reason I titled this message Coronavirus Aftermath, now I'm going to show you how the paradigm shift is going to come. Jesus said the time is near that the true followers of God will have to decide whether to acquiesce to the norms or continuing following the Lord. Look at John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. Look at the shift and what's going to take place. It's going to take place on an amazing scale. Jesus said, but the hour is coming and now is. When the true worshiper, notice what kind of worshiper, true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. He goes on to say the words of Christ, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Look at the two, spirit and truth. Let me make it very clear. When we claim to be led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit never leads us away from truth. John 16, 13 says, He will lead us. The Spirit of truth will lead us and guide us into all truth. The Spirit is not opposed to the truth, and the truth is not in opposition to the Spirit. Both are harmonious because this is the Holy Spirit. He will never impose upon the truth of God's Word. He will never impress our minds to do something other than God's word has already established. So don't be comfortable with just religion or good songs or good music or good feeling because feelings are changeable with the environment. Prime example is the environment we're in right now. How do you feel right now? The environment has changed the way you feel because we, we can't even get together and worship to keep those feelings going. Let me go back for a brief moment to the environment. All churches in the world are closed. All churches for sure in America are closed. Curfews are being enacted in many cities. Fines are being established for those breaking these rules. Presently, though, there's a general agreement as to why churches should be closed. There's a general agreement. Large gatherings, no one wants to be in a large gathering where they can risk becoming infected by the COVID virus that has devastating after effects. So when we say, well, we all agree right now, but the question I must ask you is, consider this. When the prophetic picture changes, and it's going to change drastically, right now we see that we don't disagree that churches should be closed. I've closed mine, not because I want to, but because, watch this, the law says close it. And the law closed our churches, not for religious reasons, but get this, friends, for the betterment of the multitude. So when the, when the rights of the minority infringe on the privileges of the ma majority, the majority will always win. The prophetic picture that is painted in Scripture is far more impacting than we understand to this very point. Let's go ahead and see what the prophetic picture about America is as it relates to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 and 12. I'm going to read this to you. Actually, just verse 11. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. And the Bible says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, let me break this down briefly for you. Lamb, dragon, two horns, what does that really mean? Two horns? How does a lamb have two horns? Well, little tiny stubs, but let's go ahead and describe this. Let's begin with the word lamb. When John speaks about lamb, a lamb is a fitting symbol of Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When Jesus told Peter to preach, he said, feed my lambs. So the, so the picture of a lamb a nation coming up out of the earth, a nation that exalts the lamb, 
It describes a Christian-like nation, a nation based on Christian principles. And I can tell you, friends, that's an easy one to figure out. There's only one nation in the world that unequivocally fits this description, and that is the United States of America. When you study the Revelation chapter 13 scenario, you find that there was a beast before the United States. The, the Church of Rome of the Dark Ages, for 1260 years, control the dictates of man, the conscience of man, the worship of man, the way that men thought, the places that they went, how they were to worship, what they were to believe. And Christians sought a refuge. And the Bible says that God opened the mouth of the earth to help the woman, that is the church. And the earth opened its mouth. That's why when you read Revelation chapter 13, the beast coming up out of the earth is the United States, a sparsely populated area, offering two advantages. Let's talk about the two horns. What are these two horns? You see, in Europe, it was a top-down system during the Dark Ages. The church said it, and the people did it. The powers were from the top. The people had no power. But in America, it's the other way around. A government called a republic by the people for the people. It's a grassroots movement. And secondly, another thing that these two horns represent, one is a republic, which is based on a democracy. The people are deciding. And slowly but surely, we're even losing that. But what's the second horn? Religious liberty, religious freedom. As it stands right now, for a long time in America, we have been able to worship according to our conscience. But notice what recently happened with the, with the, uh, with the institution or the invasion of the COVID-19 virus. Even the way we worship has been altered. Now, a lot of people say, well, what's happening to our churches? Why are bars, not bars, but why are uh, uh, liquor stores still open? That's not an essential service. Some people say the church is an essential service. But at the present time, I agree with the government that we should keep our churches closed. But I also suggest that they should close liquor stores because that's not an essential service. But the point I'm making is right now in America, we have liberty of conscience, freedom of speech, Freedom of religion, that's that one horn. We also have a republic where we can decide and vote on who the next presidents, go, who the next leaders are going to be. But the scenario is going to change. The scenario is going to change drastically because America, as one writer said years ago, when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. Now, America is going to play a pivotal role, according to Bible prophecy, in the direction that the world is going to take. Just read the Revelation scenario. America is going to cause the earth and those who dwell in it to worship as they build an alliance with the powers of Rome that dominated the world during the Dark Ages. And friends, right now, in the environment that we're in, I could suggest to you and mark the prophetic page. I will suggest to you, based on the authority of God's word, that here's the future. Here is where this COVID-19 aftermath is developing. When the world begins to come out of this in a completely different setting, it's already being suggested. It's already being said that we should find a common day that the entire world could rest together. Did you see the news in Italy now, where the COVID virus has made a significant impact? I, I cannot forget on the news where they looked at the waterways in Venice, Italy, and they said for the first time, it seems though in decades, where all those nice, I'm going to call them boats for lack of better terminology, where all those rowboats that are continually going up and down the cities of Venice, the waterways, they said for the very first time, you can see clearly through the water because there is no movement in the water. In other words, they're saying the environmental impact is in our favor. If we now do things to begin to stabilize our environment, then we can look forward to a more stable future. And friends, that's where the paradigm is headed. But there's something else that you can find in this paradigm. There are two other players. You find that on one side, Satan is seeking to institute the plan that he has been working on for millennia, for thousands of years. But on the other side, God is still in control. God has not lost control. Praise the Lord for that. He is still going to decide 
what's going to happen in the future. God has a grand plan that's far greater than any manipulation that the kingdom of darkness can bring to the forefront. But the Bible shows us now the players behind the scene. And once again, don't miss the idea that when I read this next passage, it's going to bring to you the broad climate, the broad environment, and all the players in this scenario. Look at Revelation chapter 16. We're going to read verses 13 and 14. Here's what the Bible says. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of demons. Notice what they're doing. Performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Wow. Think about that. Three unclean spirits out of the mouth of the dragon, that's Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, that's the powers of Rome during the Dark Ages, out of the mouth of the false prophets, that's those who claim to be following God's word, but they are not really, because the Bible describes them as false prophets. And then it says that these spirits are going out to the kings of the earth, the leaders of all the national communities, the leaders of all the nations. You see, this virus has an aftermath. Because if you are awake and listening to the news broadcast and following the cadence, following what's happening around us, it's not happening, happening by coincidence or by happenstance or by accident. There's a cleverly devised plan in place, and the Bible is describing what's behind it. Satan is working on the plan that he has been working on for millennia. He's working on the final stages of his plan that I call the grand design. But Christ says in Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Let me make a point right here, friends. This is the hour to make decisions, not based on fear, but on truth. This is the hour to say, I want my life to be in the hand of a Savior who, when all the troubles that are coming will finally pass, I can have confidence and security. I can really have freedom, freedom to worship my God according to his word. No longer fear, no longer devastation or manipulation or disease or war or famine, but I can worship God according to my own dictates. But right now, the whole world is going through a fire drill. A few weeks ago, my sister-in-law gave me that term. We were talking on, on the Zoom platform, this digital, this digital community where we can stay connected. And she said this, and it just stuck in the back of my mind. The whole world is going through a fire drill. Remember the fire drill growing up? The fire drill, the siren in the schools would sound, and we would all file out, as they said, file out in order. Don't run over each other. File out in order. When the sound is heard throughout the school. Let's all go outside and stand up. We are being tested. We are being examined to see how we are going to react when our political leaders, when the financial leaders, when the military leaders, when those controlling the world and those who are planning this new world order begin to marshal those of the societies of the world, we are being tested to see what our reaction to the real crisis will be. That's why, if you want to pass the test, the best time to decide how you're going to do it is respond to the plan that God already has put in place, the plan of salvation, the plan of financial security, the plan of freedom from fear, the plan where there will be no more disease, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more death, and there will be no more pain. But right now, we cannot dismiss the Revelation scenario. We cannot dismiss that God has made it clear where we are headed. So let me ask you the question. What would you do if political leaders agree with religious leaders that turning to God as a nation will end this pandemic? Well, the Bible suggests that. If we who are called by his name will humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, then God will hear from heaven. He'll forgive our sins and he'll heal our land. Satan remembers that. And he'll use that very power that God wants to use for good to manipulate 
and massage us into saying all we've got to do as a world and as a nation is unite religiously and politically and God will respond to our unity. Would you be willing to give up what God has established for your worship? Would you be willing to stand with the majority against those who truly worship God? And when you think about the scenario in the Bible, that's not unusual because that's exactly what happened to Jesus. When Jesus was being led to the cross, when Jesus was being led before those who had the power in their hands, they decided the following. Listen to John chapter 11 and verse 50. They decided the following. Here's what the Bible says about this strange act concerning Christ. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now think about it. Then shall they deliver you up and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. These three unclean spirits are going to all the nation's leaders, the kings of the whole world. And in the very same environment, in the very same environment, the test is going to come to those who say, you know what? Here's this small group that's refusing to acquiesce. It's better that they perish. It's better that they would die than that the whole nation perished. If they did this to Jesus, his followers are also on the cutting board. So I say it once again, and this is a powerful quotation that I want you to hear again. Astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson said, wow, one of the dangers we face is to know enough about a subject to think we're right but not enough about that subject to know we're wrong. Here's the important thing, friends. There are a lot of people making decisions today that are not well informed, but here's what God has promised. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, here's what God has promised. He says in Amos 3 verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. I like that word, surely. Can you say that with me? Surely, surely God is not going to do anything until he says to his servants, the prophets, this is what's going to happen. And then his servants, the prophets, can say to those listening, this is what's going to happen. And then we can begin to make decisions not based on fear or society or politics or religion or the norms that are developing around us, but we can make decisions about our future in serving God based on the truth of his word. And this environment of fear is massaging us to move in the wrong direction. To mas it's massaging us to make wrong decisions. That's why in every crisis you find these four components. In every crisis you find these four components. The first one is the social impact. We can see the social impact. There's fear. There's death. The social impact is clear. Every day we hear about the social impact. Then the second impact is financial. Businesses are closing. Bankruptcies rising, deficits are falling, people don't know where their next dollar is coming from. Thirdly, we find the political impact. Political leaders are looking for answers. They feel helpless. They don't know what to do next. But here's the part that concerns me the most, and God's word makes it clear. The religious impact. Friends, it's always the last thing that is enacted. The social, the financial, the political, and then the religious. The religious impact always manifests itself last before any major event occurs. That's a cadence throughout all scripture. In the days of Mordecai, it was there. In the days of the Egypt, it was there. In the days of Christ, it was there. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the list goes on and on. The last impact was always of a religious nature. That's why today, the religious nature of this COVID-19 virus is laying the foundation for the aftermath. But God has revealed to us what's going to take place. We can be prepared to stand against the opposition that's de developing. Those of us who have been warned of the things that are coming should not sit by idly thinking that God is going to take care of us and we do nothing. We've got to be people of the hour. We have to know that the Lord will only shelter those who stand with him. Let me say my brother and my sister. Let me say my pastor and my leader. Maybe, let me say to the community person that can make a decision and everyone follows. In this COVID 
19 coronavirus atmosphere. There is an aftermath that's developing. And today, we must do as they did in the days of Joshua. In the days when God led the children of Israel from that long-awaited place of, of bondage, that, that place where they were in bondage as a generation, as a people for generations and generations, 400 years, they were held bondage. They were held bound. They did not know what to do. But God had the final say. This is the generation. While men are sleeping, Satan is arranging matters so that the people of God will not have mercy. But I thank the Lord today. I thank the Lord today. And you can thank him too. You can thank him also. That in spite of how challenging the present crisis is, in spite of how devastating the social and financial and political impacts are, we don't have to give up serving the Lord. That's why the words of Joshua fit today. And so I end with these words that Joshua said to a people that were on their way to the promised land. Friends, we are on our way to the promised land. As was the case here, the Israelites already crossed the Red Sea, but they had one more river and they finally crossed it. And here's what he said to them. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Friends, the choices you make now in this COVID environment will determine where you stand in the aftermath. The choices you make now and the questions you answer now will determine how you worship in the aftermath. This is the hour of choice. The aftermath is coming. Make your choices now. Choose today, regardless of what comes, I'm going to say, I choose to serve the Lord. My family chooses to serve the Lord. 3 ABN will continue to serve the Lord. Friends, this is the hour of choice. Why? Because the aftermath is coming. Make your decision now. God bless you.